this uh, final presentation. I uh, hope the conference was, uh, you know, went really well and you guys uh, learned a lot. And uh, I, I'm really glad to be able to uh, just provide an introduction uh, for OpenCL, which is really an important technology for uh, you know the future of parallel computing and computing in general. That um, you know it's been available on the desktop for a little bit, and it's essentially available for mobile with a couple political patches right now. We'll get into those. So first, I should probably uh, just mention a little bit about myself. Um, I run a software consultancy called EGR Software, and I'm essentially a founder of one, so it's a pretty small consultancy. And I have been focusing on graphics and uh, audio engine and just media uh, development. Um, happened to be doing that with Java for over 10 years. Uh, so I basically professionally worked with like every single graphics API for Java, starting all the way back in like 1996 with Netscape's IFC, which is the predecessor to Java 2D Swing, all the way through um, uh, like using OpenGL like you know as far ago as 10 years ago. And I even got a chance to play around with the Danger SDK a little bit, which is the predecessor to Android. So when Android came out, like day one, when the G1 hit my hands, I started working with it, doing low-level development, OpenGL development with it. And uh, my long-term goal, really, is like I have a big passion about spatial audio. So if you go to my uh, website, EGR Software, you'll see this really cool studio that I built. And I just happen to live like three blocks away, too. So. Uh, I have a 32 speaker hemisphere of speakers, and you can do full 3D positional audio in it. So my, my goal eventually is to also use Android as an operating system for audio, custom audio hardware. So I, I definitely have a lot of interesting uses with Android and dealing with like low level things for quite some time. And um, the last thing that I've really been working on is a, a middleware framework called Typhon RT. And it's a performance-oriented cross-platform middleware framework, meaning that it runs on top of the J2SC environment and Android. And I've been working on that for a while, and I do plan to get it out there. Um, however, you know, <laughs> it's pretty much remained like contractors' materials. Um, while I continue to uh, build it out and apply uh, fairly new uh, techniques that are pretty well sound now, uh, Android is a very interesting uh, environment to really get it working well over. Um, and it really forced me to like move things forward in terms of modularity and a couple other concerns that we're even just now seeing with like, you know, the main uh, JVM environment or the J2SC environment with concerns of, you know, modularizing the JVM. Anyway, today's you know, topic really is about OpenCL. And OpenCL is uh, a standard for parallel programming across heterogeneous platforms. And what that means is that you can do parallel programming on CPUs using OpenCL. GPUs, which is really the main uh, area that OpenCL uh, it, it, it is being used uh, for. And other programmable devices like FPGAs and DSPs. Now, Altera is an FPGA manufacturer. And they just released an OpenCL SDK to be able to use OpenCL with uh, their FPGA uh, devices. And the really cool thing about that, and I mean, I guess it kind of gets into kind of far out there. Like, I mean, if, when you make an FPGA, you can use OpenCL instead to define how you actually create your cert, you know, what you're putting together. We'll, we'll, we'll skip that because that's a little bit more of an advanced <laughs> application. But nonetheless, it's exciting to know that OpenCL is going to be used widely across the industry. So it was actually initiated by Apple uh, with a couple of industry partners, but soon turned over to the Kronos uh, organization, which is a consortium that basically also manages the standards of OpenGL, OpenGLES, OpenAL, uh, and OpenMax, I mean, a couple other APIs that are standards for low-level media development. And so OpenCL is a, really a, a friend, a partner with OpenGL. And um, I mean, we <laughs> low-level developers really want to have access to it because it makes uh, a 
amazing applications possible. So, OpenCL really, again, has wide industry support. I mean, practically every company, except Google, is interested in supporting OpenCL at this point in time. So, I mean, I, we'll get into the whole Google drama, which really kind of came out, you know, in August. So this is all kind of like fresh, and we're living in an interesting time. If you thought Android is like all the way well defined, and uh, there's nothing new that could possibly happen, or or places it could go, I mean, we're still in the wild west, uh, it, from what it feels like for being a low level developer. Um, there's a great feature that can be had. Will we get there? It really depends on like whether developers realize and demand more from Google, in, in a way. But OpenCL basically was originally introduced in 2008. Um, and so Kronos basically makes the specification for the API, but it's then up for like uh, manufacturers, the like GPU manufacturers, um, to implement that specification. And it's gone through several revisions now. And most, most desktop environments support OpenCL 1.2. I mean, you do have to have a later like, operating, operating system version with uh, like OS X or an Apple um, to have access to, say, 1.2. Like, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually still running 10.6.8, <laughs> you know, a fairly old version, because I'm a little lazy for like uh, upgrading or whatever. I've got work to do. <laughs> But, so I only have access to OpenCL 1.0 here, but if you have the latest version, was it 10.9 now? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, if you have the latest, I think it's 1.2, it is supported on, uh, on um, you know, the latest operating system from Apple. So, the interesting, how many people out here have done OpenGL development? That's probably a good starter. Yes, this is good. So, have you done OpenGL development with, uh, like, other engines or other frameworks, or have you, have you guys like uh, used uh, open, like the OpenGL API directly? Directly both. Directly both. So, so, you, so you guys kind of have a feeling of like what it's like to use the direct OpenGL API. The OpenCL API is very similar to that. So, if you're already familiar with like programming with OpenGL, OpenCL is not a big. I mean, there are conceptual leaps like. How long did it, when, when you guys first started like doing OpenGL, did you guys get those concepts that you had to learn immediately? Or did it take like maybe a month or two months or three? So, I mean it takes maybe like a month or two to really wrap your head around it. Eh, about the same amount of time that it probably takes you to like ramp up with OpenGL in terms of getting a feeling for what the hardware is actually doing underneath the hood. So, <clears throat> Basically, there's many reasons why OpenCL is important, but, you know, for, I mean, I, I'm sure most of you have probably heard of, like, Moore's Law, or the fact that single core uh, CPUs, you know, were basically maxing out, like, the amount of transistors, the, you, the single core CPUs are not going to get faster, their memory bandwidths were going to get better, like, the, the cache sizes, the cache locality to the CPUs, those are the things that have really improved over the last, like, five to ten years, you know? So, I, I mean, when it comes to mobile, though, one of the things that is really, really great, you hear a lot of users and people complain about, is like battery drain on uh, devices. So, instead of, if you have an application that does heavy CPU computation, there's a chance you can offload it to the GPU. And that just lends to more energy savings and efficiency uh, when you can do that. Now, Pretty much every single language, just like OpenGL, has access to the Open, o OpenCL API. So as far as Android is concerned, the majority of uh, development we're doing is either Java or C++. So it's definitely possible to access OpenCL. Now that doesn't mean that there's an existing binding that works uh, for Java, which is something that I'm certainly trying to uh, get <laughs> and make happen. And uh, I suppose I'll talk about that a little bit later because I worked really, really hard, but I couldn't quite get it working uh, before this uh, presentation. So some of the code that you know I definitely want to deliver uh, surrounding this presentation, eh, still 
needs to be worked out. And it really is that last, it's not even last mile, it's like the last 10 feet, really, of getting this, uh, you know, this Java binding to uh, OpenCL working. And really, when it kind of turns out, you know, we'll, we'll see the device at the end uh, that I'm using, but there's really only one device now. And it's a development board that came out last month called the Odroid XU. How many of you have an Odroid XU? Oh crap, okay, well, <laughs> you could probably run the code I'm working on. So, <laughs> oh yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but, so nonetheless, I, mean, I, I don't feel too stressed out because like, eh, not a lot of people could run the code that I'm putting together anyway, but I am pretty dedicated to getting like a, a solid test case uh, together that runs on the Odroid XU, and it's a development board that basically runs the Exynos processor that is in the Galaxy S4, the international version of the Galaxy S4. So it's got a power VR, GPU, I don't know, 540, blah, 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 you know, I can't remember the, <laughs> the exact, you know, <laughs> markers of it. But it's a, it's, a, it's a good GPU and it supports OpenCL 1.1 EP. So the difference between like mobile OpenCL versions for the time being, you'll see an EP attached after OpenCL. That means embedded profile. And what that really means is that for the time being, like, you know, long, like longs or data, you know, you don't want to send long data to the device because it's just not, you know, necessarily geared towards that. There's a section in the OpenGL, OpenCL specification, which you can find on the Chromos website. I think in certain versions it was like section 10 that will talk about, like, you know, what are the differences between, you know, OpenCL and OpenCL EP. Um, but you know what's so surprising about where we're going and the mobile industry is going so quick? You know, you probably have heard talk about 64-bit socks and 64-bit processors in mobile. I mean, by the end of next year, we're likely going to have 64-bit processors on, uh, in our mobile devices. So, you know, how long OpenCL EP is really going to be around? Uh, it really depends. It's probably for like lower power, like cheaper devices, you know? But um, nonetheless, there's wide industry support for OpenCL. Again, practically everybody wants to use it. Oh, yes. Um, there, an app, Apple announced yesterday, actually, upstairs. They uh, put support for uh, the Google OS, Mavericks, and that. Uh, OpenCL actually runs on the integrated uh, Intel graphics. Oh, yeah, no, no, it's great because, like, and that has always been a problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. especially if you're on, like, uh, 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 <laughs> Windows and stuff like that, and you have integrated graphics, you know you probably couldn't get a driver, you know, because unfortunately in the Windows world, you know, a lot of people, if you're, if you're a gamer, if you have, you know, if you have a decent GPU by AMD or NVIDIA, eh, those drivers will support OpenCL, but if you're an average Windows user, it may not be there, so it's great that integrated, <laughs> you know, support is coming to integrated uh, platforms. Um, but, I mean, it's not just the hardware support that is exciting, it's the fact that there's so many libraries out there that exist for doing not just run-of-the-mill computation and algorithm uh, development. Like, I'm, I'm gonna add a listing to, you know, the slides that I'll post. I mean, and, and we'll see some slides a little bit later that, you know, the, the resources available for OpenCL development are uh, immense. Um, I mean, not only are game and video engines uh, supporting, you know, Adobe, you know, any big Autodesk, people like Maya, like all the sorts of tools are supporting OpenCL to provide better, uh, not just a better experience, but better functionality. And uh, interestingly enough, like, there's a lot of difficult concepts with OpenCL, and I mean, I'm still trying to get my head around, you know, some of them, and, and but the really cool thing is that instead of starting from scratch, you can go out and find existing libraries, and some of these libraries may have already had like folks trying to port, you know, the particular algorithms to be able to run well on mobile and a desktop. So you don't have to; you can stand on the shoulders of giants with with OpenCL, and that's not something you can necessarily do with RenderScript. Um, but anyway, I mean, platform independence. I mean, gosh, it, it, OpenCL runs practically everywhere, and, and iOS is quite likely going to be uh, unveiling a, a public OpenCL API. I would imagine it's got to be an iOS 8. Um, so, if you don't get this on the Android side of things, you know, if we're
we're setting <laughs> innovation and the type of apps that you know we'll see on the Android platform may be not as good as what we you know what we'll see in the iOS world. So uh, yes, the 13 dwarfs. A seminal paper that was put out um, by Professor Wu Feng from Virginia Tech uh, a couple years ago uh, kind of tried to uh, describe uh, the like 13 areas that or algorithmic areas that uh, provide and capture patterns of computation and communication that are geared towards vector processors or, or processors OpenCL type uh, 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 parallel programming. And uh, I'm going to definitely kind of quickly go through some of these. I mean, you could take any one of these particular areas, you could easily sit here and do a 50 minute <laughs> presentation on applications of a particular area. Um, so, linear algebra is uh, something that not only can be used for like graphics and you know rotation of objects and stuff like that. And there's tons of ap applications uh, for linear algebra. Dense linear algebra is when you have like all like matrices that have data tightly packed together. Like there's not a lot of zeros. Like sparse linear algebra is the uh, um, basically when you don't like you have big matrices that a lot of the values are zero. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not even a scientist or math, I, I, I mostly do game engines and video engines, so it's not like I'm sitting here using uh, open seal partial differential equations or anything crazy, you know, along that line. But these are the areas that, um, the scientific areas uh, that you can use open CL to greatly uh, speed up those computations. Now spectral methods are actually kind of useful. Uh, well, I'm mostly interested in like spectral methods from say an audio perspective. Uh, you can use FFT processing on many different you know problems basically. So that's another area that can uh, greatly be sped up by uh, OpenCL. Now, in-body methods are basically. Um, I mean, some of the more crazy stuff is like you know astronomy or cosmology or like modeling how you know galaxies may form. And you know you can do that stuff on supercomputers. You know that's not really something that you would necessarily do on a mobile environment. But for game development, uh, you could have a, a, a fancy particle system that could basically be implemented in OpenCL, and you would have many more particles. You probably wouldn't necessarily like be simulating like accurate gravity between the particles because a game engine is all about making things look right or, or look good. Without actually doing as like the minimal amount of like like actual physics that you need to do, basically. Um, but nonetheless, in-body simulations are cool. Um, structured grids are basically image processing. Uh, but that's not that's not all that you could do uh, with structured grid processing. Uh, so <laughs> there's a couple <laughs> examples there, but again, uh, probably would take 50 minutes to discuss each one. Unstructured grids are basically, um, and, and this is difficult, you know, unstructured grids are difficult to kind of work with OpenCL because um, you do have a structured memory environment that we'll be looking at. And so, like, to map things in, onto OpenCL, uh, the way that uh, things are modeled, eh, you know, it's a little bit more difficult. And again, I haven't done any of this stuff. I mean, computational fluid dynamics doesn't have much to do with game engine. So, but again, it's an area of computation that is uh, relevant. Now, MapReduce actually is. MapReduce is, uh, and MapReduce is definitely something that is viable on um, uh, mobile platforms. And that really means, and it's not just a big data thing necessarily. If you can segment your data, and actually the uh, demo code is that I want to show, I don't know if we'll have time to, but uh, take a deep look into it, is essentially a MapReduce problem. So, and basically, if there's a grid where you can solve for each uh, smaller sections of the grid, and independently of other parts of the grid, like other calculate. You don't when you calculate one part of the grid or the like a region, it doesn't depend on the outcome of the other calculations from other regions. So that's essentially kind of what a MapReduce uh, uh, approach is. Combinational logic, yeah, you know, again, encryption. Stuff that 
that I do nothing uh, with, more or less. Uh, grab traversal is something that, you know, it's not, you know, it, it is and it isn't. <coughs> I would say this is probably the more difficult, um, uh, you know, dwarf, if you will, to <laughs> uh, implement on, uh, on OpenCL. Uh, that's because, like, you really don't want to do branching as much when you're in the, in the OpenCL kernels that, that, um, uh, that you create. I mean, I know that's not really, really clear, but I think grab traversal is going to get better with OpenCL 2.0, which is a specification version that was just released like uh, two months ago. And it basically allows you to share memory between the OpenCL device, GPU, and, and, main, and the main host. So it's going to be a lot easier to share a tree structure between both uh, environments to be able to have access to it without having to transfer it over back and forth all the time. Uh, these two, like dynamic probing and backtracking, are kind of neat. You know, I guess you could kind of say, like, you know, it, it, UPS would use these two areas to basically create a program that can find the most efficient route out of, like, many, many different points. And, you know, basically use a combination between uh, both of these. And, and again, I'm not going to spend too much time, I'm just kind of more giving you an idea of, like, some of the larger problems that can be solved. And, uh, Probabilist, probabilistic uh, graphical models, again, something I don't do. Uh, neural networks and stuff like that, kind of neat. Um, I suppose a that would be more of like an AI type uh, application. So, but finite state machines, that's, that's important, at least for the kind of stuff that I do. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's like three or four areas here that I certainly have a lot of problems that fall into these bins. Um, but why categorize? Why, why make these category, you know, categorizations in the first place? Really, it's, it's awesome because like, if you know your problem fits into one of those categories or has certain aspects that fit into those categories, you can probably parallelize your solution. And uh, are these, all these categories really suitable for mobile? Yes, with caveats, maybe? You know, like, I mean, you're certainly not gonna wanna do scientific computing, like, you know, on, on a mobile platform, but even like route finding, which you probably normally for like really complex routes want to do on a non-mobile platform, I'm sure still there could be an application for route finding that would run better if you were able to use OpenCL and do that backtracking and dynamic programming approaches. Um, so, gosh. I mean, it, it really kind of comes down to some of the existing libraries that apply these algorithms that you can go out and find, the really cool thing is that uh, folks are porting them to mobile and you know coming up with like some of the solutions to uh, run uh, the algorithms uh, in an efficient way on the desktop and on mobile. And uh, I guess you know now we're really just going to take a look at what's called the CUDA model, which. Uh, Really, uh, OpenCL is an extension of, I wouldn't say an extension, it, it mirrors pretty much what's called the CUDA model, and that's uh, an API for compute that NVIDIA released in 2006. And they were the first ones to release a commercial or widely available uh, compute API, and um, it's kind of cool, I'll definitely have to test uh, the sample applications that I, I wrote, because so I have an old 2005 desktop in 8800, GTX 8800, so it's single core, so I'm really curious to see how much better things run with the OpenCL version of the sample application, because it's certainly not going to run well on that, you know, Socket 939 uh, AMD processor that I, <laughs> I still rock on an old desktop, you know? <laughs> but, um, so, CUDA provides like a abstraction layer that uh, is still reasonably low level, but understandable uh, to mostly mere mortals. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's the open source stuff still a, a, a difficult area to do programming with, but uh, it's manageable. It makes difficult things manageable with uh, a way of describing 
uh, the data and how you're executing that data in parallel uh, in a way that you could think about it without having to, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that you can get into your head. You can really get a feeling for how the hardware is working. And if I can borrow a term, um, I mean, one of the really important things to do if you're doing low-level development and you want to create the best software you can is to have a mechanical sympathy for uh, the hardware to really kind of get a feeling for how it's working. And uh, it takes time, but OpenCL and the CUDA model provide a good abstraction that isn't crazy low-level, but it isn't crazy, you know, it's in between. It's not, it's not, it's something that could be learned, basically. So, the five different areas of uh, OpenCL, essentially you have platforms, contexts, uh, devices, a command queue, and kernels. So, on a particular uh, computer with an OpenCL driver and OpenCL access, uh, you usually only have one platform. Uh, I haven't seen any environments where you may have two platforms. Um, you know, like Apple would provide the platform, basically. Uh, so, on a platform, you can have multiple devices. Now, a device really is kind of like a, a GPU is a device. If you have multiple GPUs on your computer, you have two devices that are both GPUs. You can also have a software implementation of OpenCL and that also shows up as another device. And that's what also makes OpenCL really cool, because you can program for OpenCL without having a GPU. And so you can test things out without having to have, like, uh, you know, even what your target end device will eventually be. So, and, and you can also test, I mean, you can see the differences and, um, and, and you can, like, the really cool thing about having a software uh, uh, OpenCL device is that you can then test that your OpenCL implementation running on the CPU against your multi-threaded CPU code that might be doing the same kind of algorithm. So you can test and find out, like, am I actually doing things fairly quickly or, or at least close to the maximum efficiency on the CPU? And it turned out, like, the, the sample problem that I'm, uh, or the, the source code and the sample uh, stuff, the, C, the, mat, the best CPU version I could come up with was only about 200 milliseconds, I mean, like 1200 versus 1400 milliseconds in between, compared to the OpenCL CPU version versus the actual Java multi-threaded version. So that's not bad, and you can chalk up 200 milliseconds to just threat, I mean, it's a lot of things, you know? So, but anyway, so like, uh, once you have a device where you decide what device you want to run on, and, you know, there's various uh, ways of choosing the fastest device, the slowest device, the GPU device. Just like uh, OpenGL, you have a, a way to query uh, the platform uh, to figure out what it's actually capable of. And so you basically then create a context for that device. And that context allows you to uh, basically specify uh, buffers, data buffers, uh, it, it, I mean, it could be floating point, integer, you know, whatever. You, you're able to specify the, 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 the type of data that you're going to be sending over to OpenCL for processing, and then you, you would upload that data through the context. And then a command queue allows you to actually sync up, or like sequence a bunch of different commands to occur, and some of them could be blocking, some of them could be non-blocking, you can have events. I mean, yeah, it, it, it certainly is more stuff than you would be able to talk about in a short amount of time that we're going to have here today. Um, but again, it's something that is uh, manageable and I'd say no more complex than doing OpenGL development. So the final uh, area of uh, execution is actually your core program. This is actually, it's called a kernel, and it's uh, basically a C99 based uh, language, so very much like C. Um, and our render script is basically based on a C99, I mean it's basically similar in its, in its you know, style and, and whatnot. Um, they're using like a C99 based uh, solution as well. Um, well, you know, I've been kind of already talking about this actually, like what does the OpenCL, you know, API look like? And essentially this slide is kind of going over like, yeah, it looks just like OpenGL. I mean, and it does, you know. <laughs> but 
the cool thing about that is that you can create higher level wrappings around the lower level binding, and that's actually what Jogamp uh, Joggle does. I don't know if you guys have done any desktop Java development uh, for OpenGL, but there used to be, like Sun used to have this uh, API called Joggle, and uh, a couple folks, when Sun kind of jettisoned all that work, continued to develop it. Uh, it was an interesting little community. I mean, I definitely think um, they, they were the most open when I, you know, kind of got in touch with them uh, in September about possibly trying to get their OpenCL Java binding running on um, running on uh, Android. So, unfortunately, I just haven't had a lot of time to jump in and, you know, take, I mean, like, really push that forward. Like, the, one of the main uh, authors of uh, Jocko just last Friday, you know, added, like, custom libraries, because, like, on the Odroid XC, this little development board I have, the OpenCL driver is located in a non-standard location or a vendor area for the drivers. And uh, so you have to kind of custom load it. So that's that's a big problem right now is that there's no way through the NDK, like a local LDLibs uh, parameter that you could set if, that will instantly kind of find the driver for you. Uh, so Jogamp is, Jogamp is B. And I mean, I, I, instead of writing my own binding, I didn't have time in the last month to do that. I mean, I actually started, uh, got a new client, and I'm actually working with Tout, if you guys have heard of them. Um, I'm actually writing their new video, uh, whole new video engine uh, capture uh, rendering path and whole editing solution for them. So I've been kind of, got my hands busy. So unfortunately, I kind of had to service that instead of continue working on the what unfortunately is still on the hobby side of things for me, like this is very important, it's going to be the future of computing, uh, but this is something I, I still pursue not necessarily professionally, because again, it's not widely available. If everything was widely available on Android, you better believe I would be digging into this stuff like a lot more than I uh, am right now, because it's definitely applicable to like video, video, video uh, engine and stuff like that. So. But you can get away a lot with, with just OpenGL. Like some of the new media code, like media box for things, although being extremely broken and fragmented and have to work around a lot of different little things, it's pretty neat what you can do with OpenGL directly, you know, editing a, a video stream. <clears throat> anyway, uh, yeah, things are completely in, in the infancy as far as uh, Java and uh, Android support. But like I said, I mean, so close, so close to getting things working on the Odroid. And uh, it can only do better from there. So I'm really de dedicated in the next like two weeks to finish up all the source code and uh, get the uh, Jogamp Jockle uh, working, basically. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking at another Android conference called AndDevCon. So I mean, I absolutely want to get everything working for that. So, mm -hmm. so uh, if it works on that board, will it be able to work on the Galaxy S3 international versions or four of that international versions? Um, uh, is it, does it require me to compile the AOSB? Uh, it, it would depend. It, well, it depends on the drivers there. So I'm not sure. Power. I don't think Power VR, which would be the manufacturer of the uh, the GPU uh, for that version, would have put the driver on there necessarily. So that probably would be uh, the issue. But it's the, the actual hardware itself is capable of it. Right. So. Um, Conceivably, yeah. I mean, conceivably, I, I, you know, unfortunately, OpenCL has been kind of this one thing where, in the past, like, I mean, I've all, before working with the Odroid, I worked with uh, the Panda board, which is a TI based uh, board. And uh, even though it technically supported OpenCL, you'd have to have, like, a full on service level agreement and, like, you know, be a big player in the world, you know, industry to get access to it. And this is the, like, Odroid is, like, the first time that like imagination technologies is putting things out there for the little guy, I guess you could say. So I mean they actually just opened and I don't have the link in here, but I'll, I'll definitely have to add it to the notes before I put them up. Um, I, they just announced that they have a compute SDK uh, early access program for uh, for power VR of imagination. Like so they're gonna put out they're gonna give you all their like really cool open CL code. And <laughs> I'm kind of excited about that, you know, I kind of want to get my hands on that. And it's nice for the first time being like a smaller player, 
being able to get access to full support and like if you get accepted, and it does look like they are still doing a selection process. I know. Um, well, no, they give you full support. So, like, if they like your application or whatever you're doing, like, they will give you engineering support, which is neat. I mean, I think I have a a shoe in the tout thing, but you know, still, <laughs> still hoping it happens. You know. <clears throat> ah, yes. So now, this essentially is kind of like a, a diagram of how things are organized. Uh, this is not really uh, like the individual memory, uh, like so. Like the next, the next slide that we're going to look at, maybe could have been probably before this one, but <laughs> nonetheless, uh, actually, we can just do that. <laughs> so the general memory layout is, um, of course, there's host memory. I mean, that's where you would, in your own host application, that's where you would, uh, you know. On the CPU side, you would be able to uh, either pre-compute, like say one of the really cool things that you do in the next like algorithm that I'm really really going to hone in onto is uh, called a radix sort, and it's a way that you can sort a list of integers uh, efficiently, and it's pretty fast in the CPU, but it's even much faster on the GPU. So what you can do, like say you have a 3D scene and you have a camera custom, and you you you, you call out all the objects that um, that uh, are within the frustum or what's the viewable area, now you want to sort them, like do z-sorting so that you can do some special rendering technique or whatever. On the host memory side, you would be able to fill up an array of all the z-values, and then you would send that over to uh, OpenCL to like compete on it all at once, basically. And uh, so there's a, there's a global constant memory, um, and that's where your kind of buffers are, are, are located. Um, now things are split up into work groups and then work items. And each of them have like a work group is kind of like it could be a two, like that's that's what you can see like a work group could have one to three dimensions. So if you're working on an image-based thing, you're dealing with a 2D, uh, like a 2D, like like just one slice of like that slice down there at the bottom. That would be like a 2D uh, you know, application of configuring your processing more or less. If you're doing anything with like a volumetric processing, that's what that, I mean, that's what you, it, it would more look like that uh, uh, than like, you know, 2D or even a 1D uh, uh, implementation. So each, each work group has its own local memory and each work item, now a work item essentially is a, independent, like it's kind of like your SIMD, like single instruction, multiple data. Like, so each work item applies the same kernel processing, um, and it has its own private memory, but the really, really cool thing is that with your kernel that you're processing, you can actually get information about the IDs of the work items, the IDs of the work groups, so your algorithm can do special things Depending on where things are located in the uh, in that in that kind of like a larger structure of the uh, work group and work item you know configuration. Now you can you can set that up yourself, and that's where you have to query the device to figure out what's the max work group size. Just like if you were doing some crazy texture stuff with OpenGL, what's my max texture size? If you go over that, you're, you know you're kind of in trouble. Um, so you can actually query the device and figure out, you know, if you have complicated things, and this is one of the things that I didn't get to it in the, in the slides or anything like that, I mean, I definitely want to do a white paper refuting everything that uh, the Google <laughs> engineers have kind of put out. Like, they basically put out FUD about OpenCL. Uh, they, they want to call OpenCL something that creates fragmentation uh, on the platform, and it, that's not true at all, it's a device differentiation. Uh, concern and it's completely it's not has nothing to do with fragmentation. But they like one of the points put out was like, oh, you could set up an OpenCL processing thing where you could choose 256 uh, work items or, or like a larger work group than the device actually supports, and it'll be all broken. But you can query, you can query the device and find out, you know, what the parameters are so that you can uh, you can alter things. Like for uh, for an algorithm that on a more powerful device can 
run with a larger work group or work item size, and like say, say it's 256. Um, so on a, on a better device and a better platform, you could basically queue up less uh, batches, but if you're on a mobile platform or a platform that has like more restrictions, all you have to do, and let's say, say it's 64, the max work group size, all you have to do is like divide, you, all you have to do is submit it four times instead of like once at 256. So, I mean, that's like basic, and, and like you look at like the, the, <laughs> the code to even like do that is so trivial. So, for, for, for it to be called fragmentation because you have, oh, the programmer can choose options that might not run across the whole mobile platform, or like all, all GPU devices on Android or whatever. Uh, a little dishonest, maybe. But um, nonetheless, uh, here's like another high-level overview of kind of what we've been discussing um, about the you know the four or five different areas of uh, OpenCL. So uh, again, you know this will be in the slides. So yes. Efficiently, 
and choose the best option for processing that data. And RenderScript doesn't allow you to do that. So that's why you know, folks that are creating GAN engines and whatnot don't want to use it, basically. Um, it, it, you know, I brought up that mechanical sympathy aspect. It basically doesn't allow you to apply an understanding of the hardware that you're running your algorithms on. And um, really, like, I, I, I think it's, I, I think RenderScript will be good for image processing, but I, 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 I think there are going to be some areas in that computational, like the, the 13 dwarfs that we talked about uh, earlier, um, that will just not run well on RenderScript. So, but having access to OpenCL, you know, you're, you're, all, you're all good. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. There's a very interesting issue up on the uh, AOSP Google Tracker uh, that is worth going and reading because in August, with the 4.3 update of, uh, of Android that went out to the Google Nexus devices, uh, Google actually took plenty of engineering time to like literally disable and make it impossible for other developers to use OpenCL. Now, can anybody guess how RenderScript runs its GPU computation? Trick question, maybe. OpenCL! <laughs> so, <laughs> RenderScript uses OpenCL to do its computation, and Google doesn't want anybody else except for them to be able to use OpenCL. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, I, there, you know it's, again, it's a political thing, and it's also a cultural thing. You know, it's, 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 it's because they have a position of dominance as well in the industry that they can start not playing nice, I guess you could say. I mean, I guess you could say it's also kind of like a not invented here kind of feeling to it. Um, do you have a question? Yeah, how is it different like, from OpenGL where you have extensions and different exercises and everything? Well, actually, OpenCL does work in a very similar way to OpenGL. That each other uh, uh, folks that are building drivers you know, on the CPU side, they can have extensions. Right. So you can have extensions to OpenCL that, you know, if they're good, just like uh, in the OpenGL world, they get promoted to the main core of the specification. So that is, that's, it, it, if you know how OpenGL works and how that general environment works with extensions and stuff like that, OpenCL is pretty much the same way. Yeah, but I meant like uh, for the platform fragmentation and everything, it is, it is right now. It's the same situation with OpenGL, right? Some, some hardware again has this like, some OpenGL extension and some support huge buffers and others support uh, much smaller buffers. Well, that, that isn't necessarily an extension thing. An extension thing would be more, or at least with OpenCL, uh, you know, it would be more kind of even like data types that it supports. Um, but you can query the device. You can query and figure out, does this open, like the work group size, the work item size, the dimension thing? That's, that's mostly what you have to be concerned about. But one thing I didn't get to like, actually talk about is that you can actually submit an open, OpenCL kernel to execute and you can let the driver figure out all those things. So you can actually have, and it's almost, I mean, you can think they're practically like render script. You can, you can tell the driver, you figure it out. So you do have an option to actually not have to manually set all those parameters. Um, so that, that definitely is, uh, this whole fragmentation thing is like really, really silly because it's, Again, OpenCL is a device differentiation concern. If you're a reasonably intelligent developer, that I know that's maybe an oxymoron at times, you know, but if you're reasonably intelligent and you're doing things how they should be done according to the API, you have ability to actually uh, alter the way that you uh, submit things to OpenCL for processing. So, um, but yeah. I mean, these are some funny, I mean, you should definitely, like, the 40 long posts, you know, when they basically shut down OpenCL, like, tons of developers, like, wrote in saying, like, yeah, this is kind of crazy. I mean, there's interesting, well, okay, I won't say there's that much interesting discussion, because uh, the Google folks were pretty adamant in not wanting to have a discussion. Is there a way to package the OpenCL code in a portable way so that it works, if you, if you want to support it on the platform, uh, so it works on various, you know, small but the way the, the render script is, you know, there's an LLVM, you can follow it down and create a time installation. Is there something similar to that? 
Actually, yes, there's actually an open source uh, implementation of OpenCL for software, a software uh, implementation called Toggle. So there are versions of, you, yeah, I mean, but see, Google doesn't even want to do that. You know, Google doesn't want to spend time to, you know, well, what, what it really kind of comes down to is that I think for Android, the best solution, I'm sure it's in a slide coming up, but we'll talk about it now. <laughs> I mean, the best solution is to provide a use this feature, uh, tag in the Android manifest, so that you could like you special specify for OpenGL yes as well. You know, uses OpenCL 1.1 or 1.0 or EP or not EP or whatever. You know, the, the minor ver you know version uh, varieties that you can have, and uh, then provide like a local LD flags uh, parameter in the your MDK build where you can just say I want to include OpenCL, but you pair that up with a uses feature tag, and then you're not going to have a problem. You know, with devices that don't support it, they don't even see it in Google Play. You know, so I think that's really the solution, like not necessarily requiring Google to provide a soft and support a soft like there's a minimum like it, like one of the complaints you can see down here, like the second one, you know, there is indeed a cost to building and maintaining a reasonable set of open seal drivers and APIs for Android. Google doesn't create the drivers, the GPU manufacturers do. They all want to make use OpenCL. They don't really care about render script, but because Google has an 80% market share, they're kind of not, you know, saying no yet, you know, or I mean, if there was like, you know, five different, you know, mobile OSs that would each have 20% market share, the GPU vendors would just be like laughing at Google at this, you know, but unfortunately they do have some clout, so, but right now, so far, all the, all the implementations of render script have been on top of OpenCL, so I don't think that's going to change. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it, it's it's kind of silly to say that there's a cost of even maintaining OpenCL on Android because the drivers are already made for you. Uh, it comes down to then an API, but Google doesn't have to support an official Java API. You know they can keep pushing render script, you know, to the masses, even though the masses aren't using render script, as we'll we'll see pretty soon. <laughs> Um, you know, all we need to have access to is like a local LD flat, whatever, the local build thing and a uses feature. And like, Google took more time handicapping OpenCL and disabling it than it would take to provide what we need to, you know, get access to it and build our own bindings. Like, there'll be third party Java bindings uh, for OpenCL. Like, Google doesn't have to make them, basically, or maintain them, uh, nor should they. Like, they, I mean, it, oh, yes? Oh, what do you think their, their underlying motivation is then? Again, it, it kind of, you know, I sort of kind of brushed the, the surface. It's a weird combination of, like, things. I mean, I, obviously I've always worked outside the sphere of Google as far as being an engineer. Um, it seems like there's a little bit of, like, group think going on. You know, folks thinking that they're the... I don't know, smartest folks in the room and not wanting to listen to the opinions of others. Uh, you know, the not invented here thing. I mean, I think, you know, probably a lot of people on the render script team are, team are like X NVIDIA or X in, you know, X Intel driver developers, people that I, I just don't, I don't get it because like they've shown that they're not interested in listening to developers and that's actually what these last two little quotes, you know, <laughs> kind of show. <laughs> I want to have a discussion, I, and I think we're only really going to have a discussion if a larger amount of developers know what they're missing. Um, but we're really going to feel the brunt of the pain, you know, once iOS gets OpenCL, and one or two years later, game over, man, game over. <laughs> you know, they're going to have so much cooler stuff, you know, than us. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, to make a comment like this, OpenCL does not fit the needs of Android developers. Ooh, and what are, how are you defining that? I mean, this is like something that a Google engineer, I would assume, is on the road, you know, render script team, kind of put back. Like, I mean, <laughs> sure, like the average Android developers, you know, I mean, probably, you know, whatever, uh, not doing OpenGL development or even NDK development right now. So, to say that OpenCL doesn't meet the needs of Android developers is just kind of really weird, because like 
game engine developers and video engine developers and you know scientific and medical imaging folks that are doing complex things could use OpenCL to do those things well on Android. And um, I mean, this is what you know. I, I kind of mentioned this paragraph here, like you know, not, while not a scientific you know or poll or anything like that. I mean, I can almost say, like, probably 90% of Android developers probably don't use, uh, you know, OpenCL or, or have a need for OpenCL or RenderScript. And, but the 10%, like, the remaining folks that do probably have no interest in RenderScript. Like, yeah, Google has basically made an interesting thing, an interesting framework. I'm not going to say it's bad. It's neat. It's neat. But it's not what we need. They basically went off and engineered something without even talking to their target, target market. So, I mean, I don't know, you guys probably know like the whole Bean startup, you know, movement or whatever. Like one of the like big things of that is go out and talk to your customers first before you build something. And in this case, Google just steamed ahead because they think they know what's right. So, it's going to turn out that they're wrong. <laughs> but not, I mean, the right and wrong. I think they should offer it, but just not cut off of the, the access to the hardware for the people that need it. Um, gosh, and a lot of this we already kind of like uh, brushed across. Uh, I mean, I was just going to try to you know briefly describe like when you say OpenCL actively contributes to fragmentation. Uh, you read the blogs, the Android blogs, and the blogosphere has been very great on really. Uh, discussing what fragmentation is, because it's really not like OS differentiation across the ecosystem. That's not fragmentation. Fragmentation for developers, and there's kind of like two kinds. There's soft and hard fragmentation. And soft fragmentation really kind of comes about because it's inherent to the traditional OOP way that the Android SDK is unveiled over time. Unfortunately, <laughs> And there's a lot of instances across the Android SDK where, where the design wasn't well thought out with in the beginning, and new methods keep getting added at each API level, and that just makes it very difficult to deal with uh, some core classes. I'll, the big example I use is like the view class, if you're doing just even just like 2D you know, custom views and stuff like that. There are literally new methods added to that class on every single version of Android, and it makes it kind of annoying to have to deal with, you know, when you want to uh, write an application that works across the ecosystem. So that's kind of like soft fragmentation. Hard fragmentation are just literally the low-level bugs that, you know, infect multiple, I mean, I've been doing low-level, and there's not a version of Android. Like, we could play a drinking game, I'd be probably drinking a lot, because you could name off a version of Android and I could tell you something wrong with it kind of you know, situation. So, and I, I'm not just using Media Codec and Media Muxer right now for the next generation video editing thing that I'm doing, and I can tell you this much, Media Codec is completely buggy, completely broken for certain configurations, and audio encoding, just audio encoding, is just completely broken. It's obvious it's not even unit tested. So, I mean, that's fragmentation. So, uh, device differentiation and fragmentation are two different things entirely. Um, gosh, we, are, we already talked about that, you know. Um, oh, so this is this is a cool little like uh, <laughs> you know Google Trends. Well, we'll just use Google Trends here and look at OpenCL versus RenderScript. Uh, you can't really see the little red line, which is RenderScript, and but there's a lot of interest in OpenCL. So from the developer community, I mean, we're looking at least like what, 15 to 20 times the interest, uh, and RenderScript maybe had a little spike when they got, you know, first put out, but, you know, it's pain, pain, pretty, pretty small interest. And uh, here's, here's what I was kind of getting up before, is that, like, you can literally just put in a search for an algorithm, Radix sort, OpenCL, and the first, I mean, the first five or six return full implementations of an algorithm that you'd wanted them to apply and use. Maybe you'd have to, like, you know, if you're trying to get it working on mobile, maybe you'd have to like do a little like custom tuning and stuff like that to make it work correctly. Uh, but some of these libraries already are making those approaches, like this pop the parallel algorithm library down there. Like it, you know, it, it, it there these libraries are being uh, modified to be able to work on mobile as well. But you can go out and just get an implementation and learn from it. All right, Radix sort render script, 903 results, but 
there's no actual like, and, and you come up with like, and you see all those open scale <laughs> references on the top pages, you basically come up with like a, a page that has a bunch of keywords on it, and it just happens to have render script and rate sort and open scale and others. It's not actually about an implementation or a, any, anything that you can go learn from to figure out how to even do a basic fundamental algorithm on render, on render script. So you can't stand on the shoulder of giants with render script. There's very little academic research out there, or like academic papers implementing algorithms on render script. For OpenCL and CUDA, like the CUDA model, it's wide open. Like there's so much information out there that you can go learn from. And, and apply complex algorithms in a, in a, in a you know, compu like a, you know, parallel computation manner. And that's important. It's important to stand on the shoulders of giants. Now, I love this one. When I was looking for uh, <laughs> OpenCL and Android uh, discussion after the whole big throwdown in August, when uh, Google released 4.3 and cut off OpenCL, somebody asked uh, uh, John Carmack, who is, uh, if, if you don't know, well-known game engine developer. Uh, I just, I mean, this is really the response. You don't have to be John Carmack to have this response. And really, the knee-jerk reaction to this all is like, yeah, <laughs> WTF? What are they doing? You know, like this is completely nonsensical. So, I mean, I'm not saying just because John Carmack says that that is bad, but it's it's yeah. There, there's there's a disjoint like. Of all the time that I've spent with doing Android over the last five years, they've finally gone off the rails. You know, this, this is something that's so divergent from what we want as developers. And I mean, I, I was going to say, what I fear, like, I'm not sure how much, obviously I'm not a, you know, OEM or anything like that, but, you know, within the OHA or the, you know, Handset Alliance, uh, you know, you can't, switch, like, you can't create a non-Google device if you want to remain having access to like Google Apps and like the Play Store and like other services of Google, like if you want your if you want your phones and your devices to have access to the Google services and stuff, you have to play by Google's rules and not release another device by um, like a, 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 an alternate uh, version of Android or anything like that. My my real big fear is that Google is going to then also extend programming APIs to this, this particular uh, approach, strong arm approach that they're taking with like the manufacturers. What if they finally, what if they say you cannot have access to Google Apps and Google Play Store and other things unless you like hobble OpenCL and only provide render script? They're right on that line. They've already decided to do it for their own devices. Like it only would take them a small step to move over and make that a requirement of all manufacturers to prevent OpenCL access. And that would be evil. I mean, let's just call it for what it is. That's evil. But they haven't done yet. I mean, they've done other evil things. But <laughs> that would be evil for developers if they do that. Uh, and that's, I fear that the most. Because like they've, again, shown that they are perfectly fine in sacrificing their own devices uh, in the short term for trying to, like, apparently just improve usage of render script, which I don't think that's going to happen. Um, other areas, like, so, uh, a big frustration of mine with uh, Android is that, um, you know, Google essentially uh, embraced Java to a degree, took Apache Harmony, and, which is an open source version of Java, you know, uh, like a clean room kind of implementation. Um, Unfortunately, they never even fixed all the flaws of Apache Harmony in just the essential uh, language that we had, I mean, the essential environment that we had programmed for Android. Uh, there's language features that are extremely important for creating modern architectures with, with Java and annotations being one of them, and it's been completely broken on every version of Android, completely non-performance oriented, kicking out a lot of bad data, I mean, like just garbage collection and just really horrible performance because they just never changed the implementation of Apache Harmony and they don't have any concern to do that. So for me, it's frustrating to see us already working with a hobbled version of what Java can actually be, but we have to look at what's happening in the J2SE and the Oracle Java world. I mean, we can't deny that there's language evolution and a revolution happening over there. 
And we're not going to see any of that on the Android side of things. You know, Java 8's going to have serious new features that finally, you know, things are happening in the Java world, but like, one of the things that are really interesting is that these, this, this feature train, this, this language evolution of, you know, J2C, desktop Java, is not going to stop. You know, Java 8's coming out, but Java 9 and Java 10, there are initiatives out there. Uh, one of them's called uh, Project Sumatra, and it's a spiritual successor to AMD's Apparati, which is a way to use Java, like, uh, Java code to compile down to OpenCL kernels. Um, but the Project Sumatra thing is like really investigating ways that the, JV, the Java language, the JVM itself, can be paralyzed. You could put in an annotation above for loop, like at paralyze, and it literally would convert that for loop to being a parallel operation. I mean, I'm not saying that that's exactly what they have right now, but I expect to see, um, you know, 2000, late 2014, maybe 2015, the initial Java, like JCP proposals of how to parallelize the JVM. So Java 9, Java 10, <laughs> there's going to be some crazy stuff going on with like Java in general. We're not going to see any of that on Android. So here's the thing though, like, you know, render script's one way of doing things, uh, but if, if, you, if, you, if you just enable or, or provide OpenCL, we can, I mean, like, uh, you don't need to, uh, I mean, you don't need, like, you can actually build new language features or new API mechanisms. I mean, I mentioned this whole type in RT thing, like, it's perfectly set up to be able to, you know, do stuff at the Java, high level Java layer and have it translated to the lower level without having the developer using the framework having to know all the steps of what's going on, basically. So having OpenCL available allows us to create new uh, framework and language execution environments on Android. And there's a really cool initiative, like I don't have the name off the top of my head, but basically transferring um, OpenCL into uh, an intermediate language. Like, so you can actually compile down to an intermediate language that can then be converted to OpenCL code. So you can have high-level language uh, support that generates this kind of like bytecode that then can be transferred to OpenCL. So there's initiatives going on on Kronos to do that kind of stuff. And uh, the future of OpenCL looks really, really awesome, and I'm kind of bummed we're not necessarily going to get access to it, but we should. So this 2.0 specification came out, and um, one of the really cool things that RenderScript will never, ever, ever be able to do is when you finish processing, like say, you know, on the GPU computation side, a kernel finishes processing, you can then schedule, without having to go back to the CPU and communicate and queue more commands up, the GPU itself can have continuations of control flow. Um, and that's just something that makes things even faster because then you don't have to have that communication between CPU and your GPU. So that's something that like OpenCL2 basically enables. Uh, that whole direct memory sharing thing that I kind of brought up earlier, that's a, that's a part of uh, OpenCL2 that those that functionality far surpasses anything RenderScript will ever be, able, be available or have, have available to it uh, for you know, parallel uh, computation. So, render script is neat, but it's not forward looking. You know, I don't think it's forward looking at all. So, I think we really need to embrace, you know, equal access. You know, render script for folks that really want to use it, and OpenCL for the rest of us that really need to talk directly to the, 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 the hardware. Um, gosh, I don't know how much time do we have. Oh no! <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thanks for saying. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post the code up. You know, I do have the GitHub, um, um, a, a, you know, a link that's probably in the uh, whatever the presentation of or whatever the show notes are on the website. Uh -huh. I will definitely put the slides up. <laughs> I promise to get the code up there pretty darn soon. But um, just to give you a sample of like the problem that I came across, like you know, I didn't want to do something ham. I didn't want to just do like uh, you know, creating a faster fractal you know image or do 
an in-body kind of like area of particle things flying around. Like I didn't want to do something can for like a demo. So I happened to like, uh, I don't know, just go to a social event at BitTorrent. Like I knew Bram the creator like from years and years ago. And I just happened to go to a social event over there and I kind of floated to him like, yeah, you know, I'm kind of looking around for work. And like a couple weeks later, he asked me for my resume. And so I'm like, ah, oh, screw it. You know, I'm not necessarily going to probably get a job at BitTorrent because it's, you know, again, I do graphic stuff. They do the, you know, different things, like more of the long lines of encryption and other things, you know. Uh, but that is one of those dwarfs, if you remember from the 13 dwarfs, is one of the uh, areas that you can do open seal stuff with. But nonetheless, like I went in there and like their uh, take home test is this really kind of fun little problem that, um, you know, you can solve it in like half hour, 45 minutes with the most, like, way bad, like something that will not run on this, like the, the G, like on, on, on a mobile processor at all. Uh, <laughs> but, it turns out that it's a perfect little problem, and it's very neat. Um, and again, I'll put the slides up, so I wouldn't worry, <laughs> worry too much about <laughs> taking a snapshot of this. But the really cool thing is that you can go out, you could you could search for this, and it's discussed online because it's the bit like you have to basically solve this problem to get an interview of BitTorrent. Uh, and uh, I was able to you know solve it quickly, but it is a very inefficient solution. So I basically, in the sample code, walk through and discuss. Why is it inefficient? And then move closer and closer to an efficient CPU-based solution, getting into doing um, you know, uh, multi -thread, a multi-threaded solution, getting a solution, because like the solution, the base, the naive solution, can take gigabytes of memory, if you, <laughs> which obviously is not going to run on a mobile device. So you can actually get the CPU solution down to where it only uses a megabyte of memory but it's still a complex series of calculations that it has to do. Um, so when you actually arrive, and I'll, I'll say, you, you basically have to arrive at an iterative solution for this particular problem, and uh, that's that Odroid uh, development device. It's really cool, it's the best one I've ever, like, as far as the development device goes, it's really cool. it's the best one I've ever seen. It's got USB 3.0 support, it's got EMMC memory, like a special type of flash memory. It's super, super fast. You can hook up an SSD card, like a hard drive to it. So imagine being able to run Android and have a hard drive, an SSD card, where you can do some crazy stuff. Yeah, sure, you're never going to be able to do any of that kind of interaction on, a, on somebody's phone, but it's still kind of interesting to have an environment of Android having access to different hardware configurations. But um, I guess I kind of want to show just real quickly, I know we're going to take off this. It might be interesting just to take a look at some of the videos that I created. So, so this is what you had to do for like a sequential solution. This, again, it's like a CPU type thing, but instead of processing the whole thing, you basically have to. Uh, um, processed by region. So you can see how this may not, like, you, you, if you don't do it by region, which I'll show, uh, like, one of the early ones. And interestingly enough, like, with the, with the non-efficient uh, solution, this is how you end up, like, actually, like, uh, moving over. Like, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you can. Uh, you see how it's like all freaking out, going like back and forth, uh, and it's traversal of this breath, it's a breath first search. Um, like, it's basically, if you implement the solution with like uh, a, a, a collection of just Java objects, it's extremely inefficient because those Java objects are not necessarily located in the same place in memory. So when, when it traverses like that, it's super slow because it's trying to pull in Every time it has to go look up something from different parts of memory, it basically is thrashing and cache, you know, thrashing the caches. Um, but here's, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll just try to go quick here. It's, it's kind of neat. I'll put out all these videos, and I do want to put out a white paper right, okay. of, about all this. Um, if you go start, for it. if you don't hey, do uh, anything, but you just start from the extent, like all you do is you change your starting position instead of starting in the middle, the same exact horrible algorithm. Like, watch, it's actually 33% faster. 
just because of where you chose to start, and the fact that like look look how it's actually look how it's actually traversing down everything. It's actually traversing across you know points like again these are all objects like the, the, the bad you know instead of you know modeling things as integers like I'm actually creating like a point object or something similar to that. So by actually just tra like starting at the the extent. Um, Still, a horrible solution is 33% faster because you don't have the cash, you don't have thrashing basically.